I'm, I'm so glad uh, we had people stay uh, through the third day. I think it's going to be a really fun and interesting day. Um, wireless is not working right now. This wasn't intended, but it actually might be a good thing. <laughs> we're all without it, so don't worry. Uh, we're working on it, but not too hard. <laughs> if you've parked and you don't have a permit, see us. We'll give you one. You'll be towed. Uh, or you'll get a huge ticket. You'll get a, an enormous ticket. That's the only way Berkeley makes money anymore. <laughs> and they're purposely not putting up more parking because it's, it's a real money raiser here. Um, so we have four sessions planned. Some of you don't have the last page of the agenda. We don't end at three. We end at five. So uh, we're making up more copies of the agenda, and we'll have these available for you shortly. Um, in each session, we're going to have speakers come up and, and talk for a few minutes. And we'd like it if we can get through those talks and hold your questions, because then we'll ask everyone back up for a panel. And you can, we'll open it up for questions, and it'll be kind of an open forum. So if you can, hold your questions. These are going to be short, rapid-fire talks um, to get through all the material. Okay? So, Drew, do you want to come up to the point? So good morning. So over the last two days, we've had an extraordinary set of technical research talks uh, to discuss and learn where the field of synthetic biology is today and where it might be going over the immediate future. Uh, today, we have the opportunity to consider if and how to pursue our work. Together and individually, we have a responsibility to act in ways that uh, ensure that the development and application of synthetic biology, if and as it happens, is overwhelmingly constructive. So our goal for today is really to make progress uh, towards this end, to learn how we might uh, best do this. We heard last night, uh, extraordinarily fortunate to hear from David Baltimore, president of Caltech, uh, regarding his experiences with the development of recombinant DNA technology, the 1975 Asilomar meeting, and uh, the resulting social framework by which this technology has been further developed and applied, again, for constructive purposes. We're not here today as participants of Asilomar 2.0 or some meeting like that. Rather, we're here to continue to discuss and decide, again, how we might best act uh, to leave here with plans for working with all groups, from governments uh, to industry to uh, public benefit organizations, anybody whose goal is to improve the human condition uh, and, and, and work with us to do that. So to give you a little more context for today's conversation, at Synthetic Biology 1.0, uh, there were both planned and spontaneous discussions, many of you were there in June of 2004 at MIT, uh, regarding some of the social issues that come up around this work. And a charge to us as a community leaving that meeting was to directly address these issues and make progress on them. And what's remarkable uh, about our community uh, two years from then, today, is that we're in a position to really hear uh, uh, the results of some spectacular work, both that's been completed and is still underway. So I want to just give you a little bit of context uh, about what's been going on and is still happening. Um, one of the things that happened after Synthetic Biology 1.0 is a number of members from the community got together with the support of the Sloan Foundation uh, uh, to bring together research community members as well as experts in policy and governance to think about the specific impact of the automation of long fragment DNA synthesis technology and how uh, governance, governance throughout society might best direct the development of that technology. Uh, there's also been uh, a wonderful study supported by MacArthur and Carnegie to look at how we as a community might act uh, within uh, a larger governance context to facilitate the process of making sure uh, uh, the development of synthesis technology is, is constructive. We've also seen uh, the charge to uh, the newly formed National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, and I'm very grateful that Harvey Rubin, a member of that uh, body, is here today. 
less formal, we've seen things like the Synthet Synthetic Society Working Group, which is an ad hoc collection of individuals, both from the research community and the public, uh, who are working together um, to figure out what the issues are and best direct them. And so if you were to, for example, Google the word synthetic society, you'd see an extraordinary wiki, which has blossomed spontaneously and which anybody can participate in uh, to, to, to help us figure out um, exactly what the issues are and where we, might, where we might go with them. And then finally, we're here today in the context of Synthetic Biology 2.0, but note, as you would have heard yesterday, and learn, we'll learn more about this afternoon, Synthetic Biology 3.0 uh, is being hosted at Zurich under the leadership of some of our colleagues from ETH in June of 2007. So all of that means that, well, we've made a lot of progress, and I, I think our charge for today is to figure out exactly what we can do now and, and take steps to do that. We don't have to solve everything today. The entire weight of challenges associated with biodefense, biowarfare, um, genetically modified organisms, and what have you, those aren't all our responsibilities to figure out right now, which is good. Today. Today, right. So to come back to Jay's opening remarks real quick, what's happened over the last uh, two years is that it looks like the categories of issues that have uh, uh, been discussed fall into four classes, and the sessions today really reflect those. So the first session um, is on the topic of safety and security. And again, we heard last night how David Baltimore, um, uh, you know, gave us his perspectives on safety and, and, and you know, mentioned that there's still open issues with respect to security. Um, to elaborate those on those just real briefly, synthesis, one of our core founding technologies of synthetic biology, changes the biosecurity landscape. DNA synthesis allows best or sole path access to a few, a very small number of human pathogens that aren't otherwise easily accessible. Things like smallpox, which are hopefully locked up, but for which the sequence is online. Things like Ebola, for which the natural reservoir is unknown, and so you'd have to wait for the next infection to go get it, or for which the sequence is online. Or things like the 1918 flu, which until it's reconstructed, presumably don't exist. DNA synthesis technology is distributed and accessible worldwide. And if the information uh, uh, that describes what to synthesize is also available worldwide, that's a, a significant impact, perhaps, to our biosecurity landscape. As an anecdote, uh, last weekend I got a phone call and then emails from the science correspondent at The Guardian, which I'm told is a newspaper in London. and. Uh, the individual was asking for advice on how to construct a fragment of what turned out to be um, the smallpox genome. And the reason that this individual wanted to do this was to demonstrate that it was possible to use DNA synthesis to construct something that might be part of something that was dangerous. Um, I wrote back and said, it is possible to do this. And if you'd like, you could report on the paper published, I believe, in 2002 regarding synthesis of polio virus or the more recent paper regarding synthesis of influenza. You don't need to do this experiment. And I don't feel that it's a, a, a useful um, a way for me to spend my time to help you figure out to do this experiment. I'd ask you not to do it. And they wrote back and I said, well, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get my story into the paper, certainly not in the front page. Um, if I don't do something that is a little dramatic. Um, could you please help me figure out how to do this in a way that's safe? I said, no, I can't. Um, and and I, I consciously object to what you're doing. And at this point, I copied the email, um, my email, to him, uh, to his editor, the reader's editor at the newspaper. And I also uh, BCC'd it to everybody I knew at the DNA synthesis companies uh, so that they wouldn't unknowingly help them uh, 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 with their project. And so this is an example how uh, synthesis is impacting uh, our, our landscape and other people uh, are, are, are struggling to figure out um, how we might um, uh, consider the future development of synthesis and its, and its regulation. So that'll be our first session. Second session is about understanding and perception, and I'll just introduce this more quickly. In the abstract, there are three different perspectives, three different types of relationships we as humans can have with the natural living world. The first sort of relationship is the pre-Darwinian relationship, where the living world exists and it doesn't change. And there are uh, folks who, who have that view. 
Then there's the Darwinian view of the living world where natural biological systems exist, but they change over time via a process of evolution. And now here, we're coming in with synthetic biology, and we're able to directly uh, engineer biological systems. Right? How are we going to organize uh, our society so that these three different perspectives can coexist constructively or figure out what the best way to approach the different perspectives might be? So that'll be the second session. After lunch, uh, we'll have a section, uh, session rather, on ownership, sharing, and innovation. Many of the things we'd like to do in synthetic biology involve the reuse of basic biological functions in combination over and over and over again. We're working to program in DNA. However, our current situation is that many of the basic biological functions are owned exclusively by a disparate collection of individuals. There's a balkanization of ownership which means that there's extraordinarily, extraordinarily high costs uh, in determining how to, to get access to a set of basic biological functions that can be used to make our different systems. And so Steve Maurer taught me uh, about the idea of organizing an economic and legal framework that supports continuous innovation. We have to figure out how to develop this set of basic biological functions, share them, uh, produce returns so that we can continue the process. That'll be our third session. And the last session this afternoon uh, has to do with our community itself. We've got a wonderful conference series now, uh, and it looks like that'll continue to go forward, but we don't really have anything like the American Society of Genetic Engineers or the International Union of Synthetic Biologists. And there's a question to consider as to whether or not we might organize ourselves in ways that are recognizable as being more formal or professional, in part to consider and address uh, some of the other societal issues, but also maybe to help us with doing our work. So the process for today, as Jay introduced, is that we'll have a series of expert presentations and a number of conversations around that. Uh, we're hoping to produce uh, a declaration, a written declaration that comes out from this meeting, which describes and reflects our plans, our ideas, the open issues, things that aren't resolved. Um, that we can use this written declaration as a means for sharing what we're hoping to do and what our next steps are with everybody else in the world who might choose to participate constructively with us. So with that, I think what I'd like to do is introduce Eric Eisenstadt, who is the chair for the first session on safety and security. Many of you know Eric, and um, because of his important role in our community, I'm going to spend maybe 30 seconds uh, describing how, how I've come to, to interact with him. I met Eric indirectly about 12 years ago as a graduate student. Eric was a program manager at the Office of Naval Research. He was responsible for, uh, with Tom McKenna, uh, starting a program that uh, supported the modeling of genetic circuits. And it was by this program that many of the folks who then went on to develop the field of systems biology got their start. Eric went on from the Office of Naval Research to DARPA uh, where he played an uh, instrumental role in fostering the development of our field. And if I look at Eric's uh, impact on the science of biology from, say, 1995 to 2005, he's probably had the greatest impact uh, for good uh, of any um, program manager uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, or around there. Uh, and it, it just illustrates um, how sensitive we are to the quality of the folks that we work with, and I'm extraordinarily grateful for that. Eric's now the Vice President for Research at Tiger, and uh, also grateful that he's willing to help us discuss issues of synthetic safety and security. Fair enough.